Good day everyone! I am Priyan Patrin Spailado, a level 1 nursing student at the University of the Visayas. And in this video, I will be performing the fourth and the last segment of my head to toe physical assessment which includes the assessment of the abdomen and the lower extremities. This is a continuation of the three videos that I recently uploaded in my channel. So prior to the assessment, we must prepare and gather the things and the equipment that we need. So I have prepared here a stethoscope, pen light, pen, two glasses of water, one is cold and one is warm. We have here cotton and we have here three paper clips. And then I also have checklist for the documentation. And ideally, we have to prepare also a reflex hammer and a tuning fork for this assessment. So all of this equipment should be placed near the patient or in the bedside bedside table to make it more convenient for us to carry out the assessment. Now, I will be performing the fourth and the last segment of my head to toe physical assessment which includes the assessment of the abdomen and the lower extremities. Prior to the assessment, I must introduce myself to the patient. Good morning, Mom Jenny. I am your student nurse, Priyan. And today, I will be assessing your abdomen and your lower extremities. Is that okay with you, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Now, remember, before we assess the abdomen, we have to consider the patient's history because if the patient reported abdominal pain, we have to examine the painful area last. And then, if the patient has a full bladder, we encourage her to void for relaxation. Mom Jenny, would you like to pee or use the comfort room before we begin? No. Okay. And then, we also have to take note and observe the patient's face throughout this examination to take note of any signs of pain or guarding. Now, the assessment of the abdomen begins with inspection. We start by inspecting the abdomen from the ribs down to the symphysis pubis. The normal finding is that its contour should be symmetrical. Now, to highlight any bulges, I will shine a light across the abdomen towards me using a pen light. So, no bulges should be visible. Now we move on with assessing the umbilicus. So the umbilicus should be midline and inverted. Next, we auscultate the abdomen. We always auscultate the abdomen first before percussing and palpating because these actions can make the bowel sounds more active than normal. Now, we begin the auscultation of the abdomen by placing the diaphragm of the stethoscope starting on the right lower quadrant because the ileocecal valve is in this quadrant and bowel sounds are usually audible here. the right
right lower quadrant to the left lower quadrant to the left upper quadrant and to the right upper quadrant. Make sure to palpate each quadrant lightly and on the actual setting, we listen for the vowel sounds for at least 2 minutes in each quadrant. This is to help us determine accurately whether the vowel sounds are normal, hypoactive, hyperactive, or absent. Normal vowel sounds are heard every 5 to 15 seconds. Hyperactive vowel sounds are heard every 0 to 5 seconds. And hypoactive vowel sounds are heard every 2 minutes. Absent vowel sounds means that there is no vowel sound heard at all. However, before concluding that the vowel sound is absent, make sure to listen for 5 minutes. Now, we auscultate for vascular sounds by switching to the bell of the stethoscope. And listening over the aorta. To the renal arteries to the iliac arteries. And to the femoral arteries. <laughs> Upon auscultation, we listen for bruises. Bruises should not be heard because they are abnormal findings. Now, we percuss in a systematic pattern. So the normal finding is that you should be able to hear dullness over solid organs and tympani over air-filled organs. You may also hear dullness over a distended bladder, adipose tissue, fluid collection, or mass. And you may hear hyperresonance over gas distended organs. Now we percuss each organ beginning with the liver. Now, to assess the liver, we percuss from the right lung area down to the mid-clavicular line until we hear an area of dullness. And then, we mark this spot 
which indicates the upper border of the liver. Now we percuss up to the midclavicular line starting from the umbilical level until we hear an area of dullness. And then we also mark this spot because this indicates the lower border of the liver. The upper border of the liver is usually located on the fifth intercostal space and the lower border of the liver should be on the right coastal margin. Now, we will measure the, two, the distance between the two marked points. This is to estimate the size of the liver, which is about 6 to 12 centimeters. Now we assess the stomach by percussing over the left upper quadrant. So percussion here should produce tympani. Next, assist the patient to roll on her side. Now, to assess the spleen, we percuss from the sixth rib down to the mid axillary line. We should expect to hear dullness between the 9th and 11th intercostal spaces. Now we percuss at the lowest intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. This is where we should hear Timpani. Now we instruct the patient to take a deep breath and then percuss again. Okay, Ma'am Jenny, ginhawag lao, Ma'am. Ginhawag lao, Ma'am. We should still hear Timpani. Ma'am Jenny, balik ka, Ma'am. Now, if you suspect that the patient has a urinary problem, we then proceed with percussing the bladder. To percuss the bladder, we start at 5 cm above the symphysis pubis and continue to percuss downward. You should hear timpani over an empty bladder and dullness over a full one. Next, we lightly palpate the abdomen, avoiding only the tender areas. Using our fingertips, we palpate lightly, starting from the right lower quadrant and moving clockwise to all four quadrants. So we start from the right lower quadrant, 
to the right upper quadrant, to the left upper quadrant, to the left lower quadrant. And then, we move on with deep palpation using the same pattern that we use for light palpation. We push on from 5 to 8 centimeters. So upon palpation, we take note of the size, location, consistency, and mobility of the abdominal organs. I should not detect enlargement, tenderness, or masses. However, mild tenderness over the sigmoid colon is considered normal. If Deep palpation proves difficult such as in an obese patient we then use by manual palpation. Now let's proceed with palpating the liver. To palpate the liver, we slide the left hand under the patient along the 11 and 12 rib, ribs and then push up. And then we place the right finger on the right upper quadrant and push the fingers and under the right coastal margin. And then we ask the patient to take a deep breath and feel the firm liver move down with inspiration. Okay, Ma'am Jenny, ginhawag lang, Ma'am. Okay. Now we palpate the gallbladder using the same regular technique we use for the liver. So normally, the gallbladder is not palpable. If it is enlarged, you can feel it below the liver. Now we try to palpate the spleen next. To do this, we reach over the patient and then we place the left hand under the patient at the 10 to 12 rib and then push up. And then we place our right hand just below the right coastal margin and then as we push our fingers in and up the axilla, we instruct the patient to take a deep breath. Okay, Ma'am Jen, ginhawag lang, Ma'am. So, normally, the spleen is not palpable. Now, if a bladder problem is suspected, we need to assess the bladder. To do this, we place both hands in the midline, two and a half centimeters above the symphysis pubis. We palpate in an upward direction until we can feel the edge of the bladder. So, a normal bladder may not be palpable. Now, let's palpate the right kidney. To do this, we place the left hand under the patient's waist below the 12 rib and the right hand directly above it. And then, we instruct the patient to take a deep breath and bring our hands together as she does this. Okay, Ma'am Jen, ginhawag lang, Ma'am. So, normally, if the kidney is palpable, 
you can feel a small round mass slide between your fingers. Next, we palpate aortic pulsations by placing the, the thumb and the index finger left of the midline. And then, we estimate the pulsation's width. Normally, the pulsation's width should be about 2.5 to 4 centimeters. Now, I am going to test the patient's abdominal superficial reflex. To do this, I am going to stroke the end of my pen light across her abdomen from the side to the midline. So, the normal finding is that the muscles on the stroke side contract and the umbilicus deviates toward the stroke area. Now, after we complete the assessment of the abdomen, we now proceed with documentation. Because documentation facilitates ongoing data collection and provides accurate, correct, and timely database. Now, let's proceed to the assessment of the lower extremities. Throughout the legs assessment, we take note of the legs active range of motion, muscle mass, and strength. So, the assessment of the lower extremities begins with inspection. To assess the vascular system, we inspect the patient's leg and observe the skin color and condition, hair distribution, and toenail integrity. So, we look for abnormalities such as asymmetry, venous patterns, lesions, and edema. Now we check for the temperature of the legs from the feet and up. We use the back of our hands in this part of the assessment. So the normal finding is that the patient's legs should feel warm and symmetrical. Now we flex the patient's knee and compress the calf muscle against the tibia. Is this painful? Now we release the pressure and then we dorsiflex the patient's foot. This painful. So the normal finding is that neither action should cause pain. Next is we palpate the peripheral pulses in the legs. First is to palpate the femoral pulse. To do that, we find the artery halfway between the symphysis pubis and the anterior superior iliac spine. So we compress it and release slowly. The normal finding is that the pulse should gently tap against my fingertips. Now, to locate the popliteal pulse, we bend the patient's knee and feel for the pulse in the popliteal fossa. Now, 
The poles should not be too strong or bounding in amplitude. Now, we palpate the posterior tibialis poles in the groove between the medial malleolus and the Achilles tendon. And then, we move on with assessing the dorsalis pedis pose by palpating lightly lateral to the extensor tendon of the great toe. So, we take note of the pulse rate and the rhythm and the, the, pose, the peripheral pulses should not be too strong or bounding in amplitude. Now, we check for edema by pressing over the tibia or the medial malleolus for 5 seconds and then release the pressure. So normally, finger pressure does not leave an indentation or pit. If it does, we rate the pitting on a scale from plus 1 for mild pitting, plus 2 for moderate pitting, plus 3 for deep pitting, and plus 4 for severe pitting. We continue the assessment by evaluating the sensory function of the legs just like what we did on the arms. We assess the patient's leg for light touch sensation, pain sensation, temperature sensation, vibration sensation, and position sensation. Now let's assess for light sensation. Okay, Ma'am Jenny, I want you to say, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to say touch when you feel something touching your legs. So the patient should be able to feel the sensations in both sides of the body. Now, Ma'am Jenny, I want you to keep your eyes closed. And I want you to tell me if you feel something sharp or dull touching your legs. Sharp. Dull. Dull. Sharp. Done. Sharp. Okay. So the normal finding is that the patient should be able to identify between sharp and dull sensation and she should be able to feel the sensations on both sides of the legs. Now same with assessing the temperature sensation of the upper extremities, we would also let the patient identify between hot and and cold water. Okay, Ma'am Jen, I want you to keep your eyes closed. And I want you to tell me if you feel something hot or cold touching your legs. Hot. Hot. Cold. Cold. Hot. Okay. So the normal finding is that the patient should be able to identify between hot or cold sensation and she should be able to feel these sensations on both sides of the legs. Now we assess for the patient's vibration sensation and the lower extremities. So to do this, we will be needing a tuning fork. Since I don't have a tuning fork, I will be using a pen light assuming that this is a tuning fork. So, I will have the patient close her eyes. So, we, we will let the patient tell us when he, I when she rather feels the vibration stop and when she feels the vibration start. So, we activate the tuning fork and then we place it on the distal bony prominence of the patient's leg. 
So, the normal finding is that the patient should be able to determine, determine rather, we, when she was able to to feel the vibration stop and when she was able to feel the vibration start. Now, we will assess for the position sensation. Okay, Ma'am Jen, I want you to keep your eyes closed. And I want you to tell me which direction I am pointing your toes, whether up or down. Up. Down. Up. 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 Down. Okay. So the patient should be able to identify each position accurately. Now, Let's test for the patient's motor function by assessing the deep tendon reflexes. First, we are going to test the quadriceps reflex. In this part of the examination, we will have the patient sit up with her legs relaxed. Make sure that her legs are dangling over the edge of the examination table. And then, we will also be needing a reflex hammer in this part of the examination. So, disclaimer, since I don't have a reflex hammer, I will be using this pen light still, assuming that this is a reflex hammer. So, to proceed with the testing the quadriceps reflex, we will place one hand above the patient's knee, and then we will tap her patellar tendon with our flex hammer. So, the normal finding is that the lower leg should extend and the quadriceps should contract. Now, let's test the Achilles reflex. To do this, we will have the patient bend her knees, rotate her hip outward, and then dorsiflex her foot slightly. And then, we will tap the Achilles tendon with the reflex hammer. So, the normal response is plantar flexion. Finally, let's test the patient's plantar or Babinski reflex. To do this, we stroke the lateral aspect of the sole of the foot from the heel upward. So the normal response is plantar flexion with no toe fanning or great toe dorsiflexion. Positive Babinski reflex is an abnormal finding on adults. Now, if any of the reflexes are hyperactive, we check for clonus, which is an abnormal pattern of rapidly alternating involuntary muscle contraction and relaxation. To do this, we lightly support the lower leg with one hand and dorsiflex the foot with the other hand. So, normally, we should not see extra muscle movements or contractions. Now, finally, we are going to evaluate the cerebellar function. For the heel to shin test, we will instruct the patient to place one heel on the opposite knee and slide it down to the ankle. Okay, Ma'am Jen, I want you to place your one heel on the opposite knee and slide it down to the ankle. Okay, and one knee. Okay. So, the patient should be able to do this on a straight line on the shin. Now, I am going to assess the patient's gait and gross motor function. To do this, 
I will instruct my patient to walk 10 to 15 feet, turn, and then walk back towards me. Okay, Ma'am Jen, I want you to walk towards the wall and then back to me. Okay, so the normal finding is that the patient should be able to move smoothly and with coordination. Her arms should swing freely upon walking and she should not lose her balance upon turning towards me. Now we perform the Rumberg test. Okay, Mom Jen, I want you to stand up. I want you to keep your feet together. I want you to place your arms on your side. And I want you to keep your eyes closed. So I will be standing near the patient and I will be observing her for 20 seconds. sit down. So the patient may sway slightly but she should not lose her balance. This simple test assesses the acoustic nerve, the posi position test rather, the cerebellar function and the muscle strength. Now finally, we are going to assess tandem walking. To do this, we will have the patient to walk heel to toe in a straight line. Okay, Mom Jen, I want you to walk from here to there, use from heel to toe. Okay? Okay? So, the patient should be able to walk in a straight line without losing her balance. Now, after we complete the assessment of the lower extremities, we then proceed with documentation. Because documentation facilitates ongoing data collection and provides accurate, correct, and timely database. And that ends the four segments of my head-to-toe physical assessment. Thank you for watching!